A little after 10 a.m. on January 15, 1947, Betty Bursinger and her three-year-old daughter Anne were walking past vacant lots on their way to a shoe repair shop. As the mother and daughter passed by an overgrown lot, Betty noticed something pale in the weeds. At first, she thought she was looking at a mannequin. It quickly dawned on her the bright white shape was human remains. Scared to death, Betty grabbed Anne and hurried to the first house that had a telephone to call police. When the police arrived on scene, they discovered the mutilated body of a young woman that would prove to be an unsolvable crime and would strike fear into the city of Los Angeles. This is the story of the life and death of Elizabeth Short and the infamous case that would forever be known as the Black Dahlia Murder. The story is graphic in nature and viewer's discretion is advised. Welcome to Curious True Crime Tuesday. Short was born July 29, 1924, in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. She was the third of five daughters. After the 1929 stock market crash, Elizabeth's father would lose his business and money. In 1930, his car would be found by a lake, and he was presumed dead. Her mother would become a bookkeeper to support the family. Elizabeth struggled with severe asthma and bronchitis so much so that she had lung surgery when she was only 15 years old. Her doctor suggested moving her to a milder climate for a while to try and help her with her problems. So Elizabeth would stay in Miami, Florida with family for three years. In 1942, Elizabeth's mother would receive a letter from her presumed dead husband apologizing. He had moved to California to start a new life. When Elizabeth was just 18, she moved out to Vallejo, California to live with her father. This wouldn't last long due to fights between the two, and Elizabeth would move out in 1943. This would be the last time her father saw her or heard from her again. Elizabeth started working at Base Exchange, which is an Air Force base in Lompoc. She briefly lived with a sergeant who reportedly abused her. After this, she would move to Santa Barbara, where she was arrested for drinking at a bar while underage on September 23, 1943. She was sent back home to Boston, but would move back to Florida instead. In July of 1946, Elizabeth moved to Los Angeles to visit a friend in the Air Force. She would spend the last few months of her life in Southern California. She'd been working as a waitress, and everyone fawned over her beauty. Dark black hair, striking blue-green eyes, beautiful rosy cheeks, and Elizabeth always had a flower in her hair. It said she would try and get small roles in movies while she was a waitress, and she dreamed of being an actress someday. That's at least what she told her mother. On January 9, 1947, Elizabeth came home from a trip to San Diego. She'd been on this trip with a man named Robert Red Manley, who was a married salesman Elizabeth had been dating. Red claims he dropped her off at Biltmore Hotel because Elizabeth had plans to meet up with her sister who was visiting from Boston. Some people claimed to see her using a lobby phone. Other accounts from later in the day claimed to see her at Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge. Whichever is true, if not both, this would be the last time Elizabeth was seen alive. When police arrived on scene at the vacant lot where her body was discovered six days later, they found Elizabeth Short dead, naked, cut in half at the torso, drained of all blood. Parts of Elizabeth's body had been cut as well as her right breast being cut off. A game of tic-tac-toe was carved into her right hip as well as slashes in her pelvic area. Her body was thoroughly cleaned by her murderer. Her face had been slashed from mouth to ears about three inches, and her intestine were neatly placed under her bottom. She had been posed in a sexual way with her hands above her head and legs spread apart. Strangely, Investigators noticed just her two big toes were painted a vibrant red color. At the time, there was no identification, so Elizabeth was known as Jane Doe. 
Signs of Elizabeth being strangled and restrained with possible rope were evident. Once at the coroner's, they were able to identify Elizabeth and contacted her father. While police went to inform her father, he was drunk and claimed he didn't give a crap that she had passed. He refused to go to the coroner's to identify Elizabeth. So instead, police contacted Elizabeth's mother, who immediately got a ticket to L.A. to identify her daughter. The autopsy performed showed she was cut in half after her death. There was a bruised area on the right side of her head caused from consistent blows to the head. Some of her hair was found in her privates. In her stomach, they found fecal remains. Elizabeth's cause of death was hemorrhaging from the cuts on her face, as well as the shock from consistent blows to the face and head. All of her wounds indicated this was done by a surgeon. Ten days after the autopsy, police were mailed a letter from the killer with Elizabeth's belongings her social security card, birth certificate, and her address book with a few pages torn out. Unfortunately, no fingerprints were on anything because it had been washed away by gasoline. After this, media would call Elizabeth the Black Dahlia because of her black hair and love of dark clothing. There have been over 100 suspects throughout the case, but today we'll focus on the main two. First is Robert Red Manley, On January 17th, just two days after the murder, Red took off to San Francisco with his friend named Harry. This was, of course, suspicious to police, so they went to find Red at Harry's house. Police waited outside the house for two days before Red finally showed up and was arrested. Red was given two polygraph tests, both which he ended up passing. Because of this, Red was let go. He would be arrested again later, but also released again. The main suspect of the case was George Hodel. A tip was given to police that George and Elizabeth briefly dated and he could be her murderer. When police looked into George, they found that he had been accused of allegedly sexually assaulting his 14-year-old daughter and getting her pregnant. It's also said that he's tried to perform an abortion on her that was unsuccessful. Because of this, the baby was given up for adoption. There was a trial, but George ended up being acquitted. George was a rich man, so police knew they had a long road ahead of them. Police decided to bug George's house to try and find anything they could. On February 18, 1950, investigators were listening in to George talking on the phone when suddenly they heard a woman scream. Just two minutes later, the woman screamed again. Police were called and searched the house, but nothing was found. When police left, George made a phone call where he said, Suppose and I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary now because she's dead. Oddly enough, George's secretary had just died recently of an overdose. Investigators believe from the transcripts from bugging the house that George was paying off law enforcement. By April of 1950, police had enough evidence to link George to Elizabeth's murder and went to make an arrest. Unfortunately, George had already fled the country and was unable to be captured. George's son, Steve, believes his father killed Elizabeth and even more victims. When Steve got older, he decided to look further into his father. In 2013, Steve did a soil test for human remains at his father's home. The test came back positive. Unfortunately, with that being the only information, there was nothing that could be done. Most evidence and files for this case have gone missing with no understanding of how or why. Because of this, the case is still unsolved to this day. It is suspected that the Black Dahlia murder is also the Cleveland Torso Killer. If you'd like to know more about that, check out my first video on the Cleveland Torso Murders. Thanks for watching, folks! Don't forget to subscribe, leave a like, comment, hit the bell, and check out our merch. I'll see you again on another Curious True Crime Tuesday. And remember, stay curious.